Perfect. All right. So that should be up. It is. Um, so some of you would have missed last week where we did, um, we did approaching lakes. Uh, I'll just minus. Uh, we did approaching lakes and we looked at streamer and wet fly fishing mainly. And where we left off, we kind of finished up with, okay, well, look, fish don't want to eat woolly buggers. They don't want to eat streamers. Um, there are more insects around that kind of thing. So that leads perfectly into here talking about warmer months and fishing nymphs uh, on lakes. Uh, it'll just take a moment to tick over slides while it gets going. Perfect. So when, where, why, why would you use uh, lake nymphing as a technique? Essentially it's when insects are around, when we have mayfly, when we have midge, um, when the weather's calm. I mean, you can fish this way with other flies we'll talk about later and fish blobs and other things like this, but effectively you're fishing it in warmer months when the fish start to hone in on those smaller food sources like mayfly, um, midge is up there and move away from like, fish just looking to feed on your smell, your bigger bait fish, your streamer fishing, which is stuff we'll do in more uh, rougher weather in the winter, that kind of thing. So um, I'm not sure where everyone's tuning in from, to, from today, but we'll try and keep this on a Victorian sort of context. When we talk about leaders, we're talking about two flies. You can fish three and a lot of this can be applied overseas in Tasmania where you can use uh, different rigs, but yeah, you'll we'll kind of see that as we go along. And as always, what I'm going to try and do is I'll try and punch through this really quickly because you'll all get sick of hearing me talking and hopefully we can punch through and then we can field the questions and then we can answer them, come back to the slides if we need to. So we talked about this last week. What gear do you want when you're getting into this sort of fishing, when you're doing it? 10 foot rods on the lakes is almost a must have. Uh, we talked about it last week when we were talking about multiple fly rigs, uh, landing fish is easier, casting is easier. Nymph fishing, dry fly fishing on the lake, um, streamer fishing, 10 foot rods are really what you want. I've got six to eight weight there again. Um, six, seven is pretty nice for me. I do use the eight weights um, because again, it does help with delivery. And at the end of the day, fishing is a lot about efficiency. And if you can present your fly quickly and you're in contact early, which an eight weight can help do, um, that's what I still go for. Floating lines is this technique is what I generally use. Um, a lot of people, you can take this, you can get this, this can get really complicated because we can start talking about poly leaders. We can start talking about sink tips, midge tips for, for nymphing deeper. But uh, for today, we'll keep it quite simple. Um, floating lines, and then we're gonna use nymph weight and our leader to achieve depth. Um, I think I see some chats popping up and if you do have a question, guys, pop it in the chat now so you don't forget. You can always pop it in there now um, and then we can come back to it later and that way the order of the presentation, it might might work out better for yeah, us. Yeah, like I said to everybody, if, if you just put a capital Q at the front of your question so we can scan through it at the end of the presentation and that way we'll have a sequential um, series of really clear questions. So, sorry about that, Tom. Um, continue on. No, no problem at all, Andrew. So, 10 foot rods. Floating lines. Uh, typically, we want a weight forward line. We'll talk about that a little bit later. At the end of the day, uh, fishing from a boat, you're generally going to have the wind behind you, but land based, sometimes you are going to want that turnover and that power to punch. Um, nine foot tapered leaders, you'll use both mono and fluorocarbon. Which you're going to use is going to depend on whether you're going to be fishing dries as well as fishing your nymphs. Um, or if you want to achieve depth, you'll go fluorocarbon most likely. Uh, and I've got three or four X there. We'll talk about leaders a little bit further down. Um, I buy nine foot tapered leaders out of the pack and then I typically cut some of the butt section off because we don't need that full nine foot of taper to help us. We only really need six feet or that sort of thing. So we don't want to be, yeah, we don't want to make our leader overly long for no point, for like no reason. Um, and then, yeah, tip it's the same, mono or fluorocarbon. So, you want to, when we talked last week about streamer fishing and we talked about uh, pulling wet flies, that kind of thing, we talked about using our fly line is the way to achieve our depth. And that's how we do it on the lake when we're fishing streamers, we're fishing sinking lines, type threes, fives. When we're nymphing, we're generally, when we're nymphing, the fish are generally in Australia high because the food's up high. Our lakes aren't overly deep. You look at Victorian lakes where you do this, 
your Tolondos, your Wenderees, your Fines. They're not overly deep and the fish are high. Same in Tasmania, the fish are high. Um, Penstock, Little Pine, Four Springs, Bronte, all of those lakes. And then even in New South Wales, if you were going to fish for midgen fish on Tantangra or Yukonbeam, they're up. So <coughs> floating line's good. And then we're using the leader to get down. And you'll be surprised at the variation in fishing a fluorocarbon tapered leader compared to a monofilament tapered, uh, monofilament tapered leader. The fluorocarbon will sink a lot quicker, like a lot quicker. So I typically go for the fluorocarbon tapered leaders generally, unless I want to stay very high in the water column. The reason I'd want to stay high in the water column is if I think the fish are feeding off the top. Like if you do have a mayfly hatch and they're right up on top, there's nothing worse than sinking and fishing beneath the fish. So you want to be up high. Also, if you fish a monofilament tapered leader instead of a fluorocarbon leader, that lends itself to changing your flies quickly without changing any leader material. You can quickly pop dries on and fish dries at the fish. And when I guide in Tasmania, I'm typically getting clients to nymph on monofilament tapered leaders with mono tippet. Um, the reason for that is the reason you go to a lake uh, during this weather, during when there are mayfly about, is you hopefully want them on top and to be able to fish dries. So if they are feeding on that stuff anyway, they're going to be high. So mono's the go there. But if you turn up at a lake and there's nothing happening, I would generally go for fluorocarbon just to cover a range of depths, get the flies down. And as I said, we can't like with the woolly buggers and streamers last week, we do have beads on some of the flies and yes, they do achieve depth to a degree, but for the most part, we want to be using the leader. Um, and yeah, we'll talk about the beads a little bit later. So here's a very simple um, leader construction for nymphing. So it's in Victoria, so or the mainland of Australia, we're only allowed two flies. So got a nine foot tapered fluorocarbon leader out of the packet. First thing I'll do is I'll typically cut off two foot of the butt section because the butt section of a tapered leader when we get it out of the pack is like 60 pound or something crazy. And realistically, we don't need that. Um, it's not gonna, like our tapered leader is designed to just transfer that energy through, to keep it going through. So you don't need, if your fly line's that thick and the start of your leader's that thick, it's a bit unnecessary. We want it to taper down. So you can cut two feet off the butt. Then I typically tie a tippet ring onto the end of that. So we're looking now at a seven foot leader. You could even make it a little shorter, make it six foot maybe. Uh, the tippet ring is a, for me, an absolute must you'll find you'll go through so many, so few tapered leaders um, when you have a tippet ring on there. Because every time you break off or you get stuck in a tree behind you or something happens, you're gonna break off at the tippet ring. So you have that butt section, that main tapered leader that can last you a whole season really. And it's very handy. And then you just need to adjust the tippet on the end. Um, another way you can do it, and Ian Barr, who was a world champion, he's a uh, competition fisherman from the UK, and he's very heavily involved with airflow lines. He, um, he doesn't use a tapered leader. He actually uses like three foot of about, it would be something like 12 to 15 pound fluorocarbon. And that effectively does the same thing as the tapered leader. It just helps the turnover a little bit. It's not a huge gradual tapered leader, but Ian just does that just to give him a little bit more turnover. And by having thick fluorocarbon at the butt section of his leader instead of the tapered leader, it's actually still achieving the same thing. That weight, that like thick 15 pound, 12 pound fluorocarbon is gonna help your flies and get your, uh, sorry, help your leader sink. All right, so we've got that, then we're going to a tippet ring. Um, I typically go two foot from my tippet ring to my first fly. I, having a tippet ring there, I don't think it bothers the fish at all. You could almost tie your fly off the tippet ring, but I like it keep it down a little bit and in comps we have to. Um, and then I like, when I'm nymphing, I like my flies to be five foot apart, thereabouts. So you wanna cover a reasonable amount of water. It's not the end of the world if you do fish them a little shorter, four foot could be fine. But um, like I said last week with streamer fishing, like one of the critical times in all our casts, if you, every single cast you ever make, if you get your flies to land, bang and turn over straight and hit the water, um, you're in with a chance of catching fish no matter how tough it is. Fish love the flies on the drop. They love them landing. They react to them landing. So if you can get those flies to land spaced out further apart, you're covering more water initially on the drop. So I'll always like to have my flies as far apart as realistically possible without making the leader too hard to manage. And as I said last week, guys, it's all about efficiency. 
Um, if it's going to be if fishing two flies is going to create too many hassles for you, too many tangles, you're far better off having your flies in the water with one fly. That's going to be more beneficial than two flies in the water 50% of the time. You'd rather one fly in the water for the whole day and not have any tangles. So yeah, way up it. It's all about efficiency. Um, it's the same if you're fishing three flies. Don't overdo it if it's too hard. You're better off fishing two flies without a tangle all day than trying to fish three flies and, you know, getting tangled every half an hour and then being out of the water for 15 minutes. So what sort of presentations can we uh, put into place when we're nymphing? Realistically, we're not going to be fishing very fast. So we're fishing small flies. So um, like we talked about last week with streamers, it's like, well, if you fish bigger, you're probably going to fish them faster. And if you're fishing smaller, you're probably going to fish a little bit slower. Um, think about what nymphs are doing in the water column when they're sending to hatch, they're moving around. They, they don't move that quickly. Um, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't throw the odd quick retrieve in though, because they do eat the fly and move very fast, particularly rainbows, flat out roly poly, as I've got there as a second retrieve can be very, very good. So the stable retrieve for nymphing is figure eight. So that's our hand twist retrieve where we're taking in the line at each end. Um, the reason is it's really nice, it's gradual. The advantage of a figure eight retrieve over doing, trying to do little short strips like that and keep the fly moving is that you're always holding the line in your hand. If you're going draw and then you're taking your hand off the line to grab the fly again, so often the fish eat it and it can slip through or they take and you don't have control. If you're figure eighting, your hand's always on the line. So when the fish eats it, it's like, whack, I've got him. Um, roly poly is very good. As I said, it's a, it's the same as a figure eight. Like if you could figure eight as fast as you could roly poly, you'd probably just figure eight, but it's hard to go quickly with a figure eight. So if you do want to speed your flies up, two hand retrieves, taking the line and moving it quickly is really good. Long draws, very important as well. I mainly use a long draw if I'm presenting at a fish. So um, this photo is from Lake Wendery during the state competition I won there a couple of years ago when it was a mayfly nymphing affair. And we had mayfly um, on both days hatching. And pretty much when the fish are up and they're feeding, when there's a lot of food, you really need to get, you've got to be quick. You've got to get the fly in front of them. But more importantly, what you can often do is if the fish is rising, moving up wind towards you or something like that, as soon as your flies hit the water, First thing I like to do is give one or two or three long draws, like really long draws to get tight to the flies. Because no matter how good a caster we are, our flies are never gonna land perfectly straight. So there's always gonna be some degree of slack in there. So you need to get tight as soon as they hit the water. But also what those draws are doing, the flies hitting the water, the fish is reacting to it. And then as you're drawing it away, it's kind of exciting them into eating it. And they often hear it land, look at it, see it going away and eat. Whereas if you just made the cast and the fly's gone dink, the fish looks up at it and it's just kind of aimlessly sinking. It's not that like enticing. It's not very exciting to the fish. So they typically want it to land and go plop. They look at it and then it moves away and then they grab it. So, um, but most important thing about the long draw is as soon as the flies hit the water, get tight to them. Most important thing, because if you cast and they're slack and the fish eats it, we're not going to know about it and we're not going to catch them. Um, and then we've got static, uh, static presentation. And that is if you're fishing uh, from a boat, a moving boat, all you're doing is retrieving at the same speed that the boat's drifting down. So we don't want to move our flies. We want them to be sitting dead static there. And throughout your cast, they'll probably, they'll sit pretty high if you're fishing a mono leader. They will only be, you know, within the top three um, feet of the surface. And it's very good when the fish get tough and when they see a lot of flies moved, like if you're fishing a, if you're fishing a stocked fishery, um, say in the UK, or you're fishing anywhere where the fish see lots of flies, lots of moved things going past them, it, they're a lot more confident eating a fly that's static. So uh, fishing that way, just keeping in touch with the flies, very good. A lot easier land-based because you can kind of just cast it out there and sit there and watch it. So, but then take up with the wind if it's blowing in. But very important, um, fishing static as well. Now, I haven't actually, I think I haven't actually put a slide in here on it, but with, it's the same with um, streamer fishing as nymph fishing like this. When fish does eat our flies, don't, please don't lift the rod. You want to keep your flies pointed, your rod tip pointed at the fish, pointed at your flies, 
And when you are figure eighting and he eats the fly, you just want to draw into him, take a long strip or long draw. Um, because a lot of the time when we're, when we're fishing, have I got a pen around? Yes. When we're nymphing, typically um, the takes are generally quite obvious. It's generally just like whack and you've got him. But if this is our rod and the water level's here, we typically have a nice loop of line entering the water. We'd all know our rod tip's just above the water, say a foot above the water, and you have that nice little loop of line there. When a fish eats our fly when, our, when we're nymphing, what happens is this loop of line will tighten. It'll just lift. So that's a really good indicator. Often that'll happen before you actually feel the fish eat the fly. So when I'm nymphing, I try to watch the loop at the end of my rod. And if I see the loop of line lift and start to tighten, all I do is just do one big long draw because what that's gonna do is it's gonna hook the fish because he's already eaten it. Or if I bumped a little bit of weed or the wind's done it or something like that, a nice steady controlled long draw is just a really nice presentation because the fly's sitting there and I think, oh, that's a take. All I've done is just make the fly go whoop like that. It's just lifted in the water column very gently and if it's not a fish, I'm still fishing. Whereas if you're watching it there and then it lifts and you go strike like that or you do something a bit crazy, um, your flies are going to fly out of the way. There may have been a fish there and you may have missed him. You're not fishing. So you just want to be calm, controlled. Look at the fly. If you feel often they'll just go dunk and they'll tighten and hook themselves. But if they're really touchy, sometimes it'll just go tick, tick, tick. And if that's happening, long draw and you'll generally hook them on the long draw. And if you haven't hooked the fish, that's absolutely fine because you're still fishing and you can come back or another fish that hasn't eaten your flies can swim over and eat it. So remember that it's a big one. I, sorry, I should have put that in the presentation. I forgot, but just remembered it now. So another form of nymphing other than, and that was again, a very introductory kind of uh, talk about um, just conventional nymphing on a floating line and we'll come back to it. But I wanted to put this slide in because plonking, uh, if you're in the UK, they'll call it bung fishing or fishing the bung. Um, a bung is just an indicator. Um, over here in Australia and New Zealand, we typically call it plonking. Uh, what it is, it's nymphing under an indicator. So like we talked about um, just before, when fishing gets tough and the fish are sick of seeing flies moving, often they want the fly sitting static. So a really good way to fish a fly static is to fish it under an indicator. It's just effectively like fishing under a float. So uh, what are we doing? The lead is very similar. You don't want a fluorocarbon tapered leader with this. You want a monofilament tapered leader because you don't want that leader sinking and then pulling your fly under every time you pick up to recast. So you want it sitting up on the surface. So you want monofilament tapered leader. Again, nine foot, cut a bit of the butt section off and then go tippet ring. Uh, so we're left with about seven foot. Then we want to tie uh, indicator off the tippet ring. Now, if you're not in a competition, that's great. You can just use a big fluffy bit of yarn or a pinch on indicator. Uh, most of Jim Allen's fishing in Tasmania is just sitting watching an indicator on the lakes and he catches so many fish doing it. Um, I like to fish a big chubby Chernobyl ant. If I have one, I do have one here. I like to fish a chubby Chernobyl ant like this uh, as my indicators because one, they're really buoyant. They spend, suspend a lot of weight, but also the fish come up and eat them like they do on four springs there. Um, so indicator uh, indicator dry fly and then we want to suspend our nymphs beneath that what length you suspend them at that totally depends on where you are if you're fishing a very shallow lake like lake wendere you're probably only going to fish a one fly three foot down you don't want to be beneath them as i said you kind of want to be at the depth where the fish are so if you're fishing four springs it's a little bit deeper i normally go six to eight feet depending on the season and how much the wind uh, the weed's been uh, killed off over winter so you kind of just want to know what depth um, the weeds at and the fish typically hold out in that lake. And then you want to just try and put the fly there. And the great thing about this is it's very efficient. You fish short, you flop your fly out there, you have a beaded fly that gets your flies down to the depth you want them to be there. And they're sitting in the zone the whole time throughout the cast. Whereas if you are trying to get to say eight feet down with that conventional technique we were just talking about on a floating line, it would take a long time to cast out sit there, watch your line and let your flies sink, 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 get down. It'll take a long time. So fishing under an indicator is really good when you need to get your flies down quickly. Um, yeah, and now I've got Pensock, again, another shallow lake in Tasmania, you would fish a lot shorter. Um, you fish one metre or so 
Another example, just off the top of my head, if you think about Purrumbeet, fish Lake Purrumbeet, and you're fishing in the swamp somewhere like that, six feet is probably ideal throughout all the weed plumes in there. And again, that's a great way for a lake like that because you're punching down in between the gaps of the weed, getting you to fly down into all those holes very quickly. And again, very applicable on your newlands, your Hepburns, all those lakes where they have weed pockets and you can't cast over the weed because you're going to be pulling your fly back through the weed. So what you can do with this one is you can cast over the weed and then get your fly down. And then when you hook a fish, that's a different story. <laughs> good luck. But it's a really good way of extracting fish in that sort of water. Um, and yeah, very like there are some fish from Four Springs last season. Amazing fish. You catch some really good fish and big fish doing it because it's a presentation they don't often see and it catches the tough fish a lot of the time. Okay, so fly weighting for um, nymphing in general. So we're, ma we're leaving the plonking indicator fishing aside, coming back to general nymphing. I prefer unweighted flies. Um, they have a better presentation. They fish more naturally. I think fish eat them better because when they, in we've got to remember a fish doesn't, we think of a fish as biting a fly. Um, they actually inhale a fly. So the more weight you have and um, the tighter you are to it, the kind of more resistance there is when the fish does try to inhale the fly. So unweighted flies, I think they eat them better and they hook up better because they inhale them and get a better hold of them. Um, also, it's a better presentation. As they're falling, there's, we talked about it last week, there's a lot of currents that occur in lakes that we don't think about. We think of rivers having currents and lakes not having currents. There's a lot of wave action. It's very natural for a fly to be moving with the current kind of wafting around. So again, unweighted flies, I think, give a better presentation. How do you affect the sink rate of a, um, uh, an unweighted fly? Because there's no lead in it and there's no bead on it. Uh, the hook gauge, if you're a fly tire or you buy flies, look at how thick and how heavy the hook is because you'll be surprised at how much that affects the sink rate of the fly. And I've got an example for you in one of the latest slides here. Um, you can use a bead. Um, I if I'm using a bead, there's only two reasons really. One, because it's windy and I want to stay reasonably tight to my flies because it's very chaotic um, or I want to get down a little bit more or to attract, um, attract the fish. I mean, a fantastic nymph, it's the world symbolist nymph. I won't grab it out because it's on one of the next slides. Orange beaded black seals for nymph is fantastic. So simple and fish just love orange beads. Um, Particularly in winter, this technique works. Orange beaded black nymph, something like that, is really good. Okay, <clears throat> so flies, and we'll be done. Uh, we'll get through this in a sec, guys, and then we'll have some questions. You'll probably be happy. Fly options. As I said uh, last week, Flies are the least important thing. For those of you that weren't here last week, I talked about three core points with lake fishing, and that is um, location, depth, and retrieve. And those three things are the core, they are the most important things we need to have correct and have it in a line when we're lake fishing. Because if you're not in the right location, you're not fishing at the right depth, and you don't have the right retrieve, you can't catch a fish. You could have the world's best fly, but if you are at the wrong depth, you can't catch them. Or if you had the world's best fly and you're in the right location and at the right depth, but had the wrong retrieve, you still can't catch a fish. So you need to be, you need to have the location correct. You need to be at the right depth and you need to have the right retrieve. And once we have those things sorted out, that's when we can start tinkering with flies and fly changes. And that's where we are now. So three must have styles of flies. The ones I use most often are Traditionally tied nymphs, I've got, I think I've pulled them on my chest to remind me there. Traditional style nymphs, we've got crunches, we've got dole backs, they're the three staples, and I've got slides with photos of them in a sec. Buzzers can be very good, but one issue I have with buzzers, um, so buzzers, we'll, uh, so we'll talk about that coming down. Sometimes buzzers, um, I'll talk about buzzers when the slide pops up. And then we have other flies. We can always put a little damsel on the point when we're nymphing. Um, you can put a blob on the point, um, like so. A blob's really good on the point because it has so much bulk to it. Um, what it does is it actually keeps you tight to the fly. The volume and the bulk of the fly keeps you tight, and it's very good for control. Um, a booby can be very good. A booby um, will float high and it'll keep your flies high in the water if you want to do that. Um, 
And there's other flies, Tom Jones, like stick caddis, those kind of flies, which are good to throw in there as well. Okay. Traditionally tied nymphs. So there are some staples of mine on the left that I like to fish. Again, these are the flies that, these are very, very easy flies to tie. They're like your classic hares ear or your classic black seals for a nymph or the top there, there's a, a crystal nymph. And they're always uh, a starting fly for me because they're the most, when you look at a, um, a mayfly nymph in a lake, what does it look like? Probably in this photo, it looks most like the fly, the pot scrubber nymph on the bottom right there um, with like the olive brownie seals fur on it. Very realistic, very good, and just a very consistent fly. And they just catch fish when they're, those fish are on the right, Dave Hempel and Michael Bradley. Um, <laughs> when fish are on mayfly, they're just a fantastic fly because they're extremely natural. So um, they're, if I could only have one style of nymph, um, I would have traditionally tied flies such as these ones here. Um, and then at the bottom there, you can see the orange beaded uh, black seals for when I was talking about. Super simple to tie, um, but just so natural and they catch so many fish. Then we've got crunches. Crunches are another style of fly I really like. Um, they, crunches is kind of a bit of a midgy, a bit of a mayfly sort of fly, but they're really nice. Um, they have that little soft tackle at the front. So if you're wondering what's the difference between a cruncher and a normal nymph, a cruncher is a fly that has a hackle at the front. Um, they can be brown, they can be olive, they have uh, cheeks, they have holographic cheeks like the traffic light cruncher in the top left there. They can be very natural ones at the bottom there, the bottom left. Um, so again, they're just a nice, they have a different profile in the water. And when you do find the fish and they're very heavily pressured, sometimes it's good to just mix up your flies a little bit. Um, and I'll talk about it in a sec, but if I had two flies on and I was fishing on a lake, I'd probably have a traditional nymph, traditionally tied nymph, like the slide, like one of these ones on the point. And then on my top dropper, I would have a cruncher like this. Cruncher also sinks more slowly because um, it has the hackle there. So it has more volume, more bulk to it. So they do sink slower than a conventionally tied fly, a uh, conventionally tied nymph. Um, that's the clip on the right. There's a um, YouTube video of me tying pheasant tail cruncher. Those two flies on the left there are what I won the uh, state championship round competition on Lake Wendery on. Traffic light cruncher and a brown cruncher. Very simple flies, but extremely effective. Cool. Now we have doorbacks. Uh, they're an English fly. They are a very good fly when midger around. Um, but I mean, Josh Flowers in Tasmania, he ties a claret one and it's very good during a mayfly hatch. They're very cool flies. Again, they all really, they almost all do the same thing, but they have different profiles in the water. And some days the fish just take a shine to, to some of them. Um, I've put on there three uh, different styles of ties. They have, they can be very holographic, very flashy. They can be very subtle, drab. A lot of them out there online. So have a look. Rainbows seem to eat doorbacks really well. And I guess they're a very midgy fish. So very good in New South Wales as well, these ones. But there are some Tassie fish on the right. Um, rainbows that eat doorbacks really well on Penstock and Four Springs. I put in the bottom left corner there, um, the doorback, Tolondo with Tim Strong there his name, because um, when we had some competitions at Tolondo a few years ago, good friend Tim Strong from Tasmania came over and he won, uh, won one or two of those comps. But he did really well on Tolondo fishing a doll back with in amongst streamers. So he was fishing woolly buggers very slowly and he fished a doll back with them because there are a few mids around and uh, there were some rainbows there and there were some browns that seemed to take a shine to the red holographic. So Doorbacks, you can, like all these nymphs and all these flies and techniques we're talking about, they all kind of blend into one another. So don't be afraid to try some of these flies in amongst other techniques or other flies in this sort of technique. So um, I just thought I'd note that one. Also, have a look at the difference in gauge of the hooks there. They're all, there are three different brands of hooks there. Um, look at the bottom left and the bottom right. You'll see they're very different. The bottom right's a very heavy gauge hook and that fly sinks very quickly. That sinks at a similar rate to a fly with a bead on it. So uh, you can get an unweighted, a nice slim looking realistic fly with a heavy gauge hook that'll sink really nicely. So something to remember. 
buzzers. <laughs> I have a love-hate relationship with buzzers because I love fishing them and they don't always work. Um, what I was going to say earlier when I was talking about buzzers, I didn't put them in my three core must-have styles of flies because when fish are eating midge, and particularly in Australia, when our fish are midging, we seem to be able to catch them on a range of other flies. So when our fish are midging in Tasmania, and you go out and you fish on Lake Burberry, or you might go and fish Great Lake in the morning and the fish are midging, you can throw a dry at them and catch them. Or you can fish a, um, I did very well at the Woods Arthur's Lake competition on Woods early in the morning. We had some canid feeders and a few midge feeders and I caught them on crunches. So when fish are midging, you don't have to fish a, fish a buzzer, which is why they're kind of a, they're a lovely fly to have. They're really fun to tie and they do catch a lot of fish, but I don't think they're essential in Australia. In the UK, they're 100% essential where some of these photos are taken. Um, and UK buzzers or European buzzers are massive compared to ours. If you go to a lake uh, in at about say 9am in the morning after a big midge hatch in the morning, you'll see a lot of our midge are like size 18s or 16s. They're very, very small. Uh, if you go to the UK and you see shucks from buzzers that have just hatched, they're like size 10s, they're massive. So where if you are buying flies or you're tying flies and you're looking at some videos of people tying buzzers from overseas note that they are massive because where they're fishing their buzzers are massive and a buzzer is just a, a chronomid um in australia our buzzers are small so that's just a very an important consideration to have um i i do quite well in tasmania at times uh on the holographic the bottom buzzer there you'll see in the top one the holographic pearl a holographic red and pearl rib and I do well on it not when the fish are midging I just I like it when the water's a little bit dirty or slightly off color and the color and the glint and the flash is really nice and the fish just seem to like it because it's kind of more of an attractor style fly rather than it being a midge pattern so yeah And then, like I said earlier, some other flies you can mix in. Um, I've got an unweighted damsel there on the top left. Uh, very good fly to put on a middle or a top dropper. Um, you can also put a little beaded woolly bugger on the point and nymph with it as well. And you can kind of cover two bases. You can do the same with the Tom Jones there in the middle. A stick caddis on the bottom right is really good as well. And again, in the UK, uh, they love their cormorants. I've got a cormorant there in the top right for when fish are midging. The top, the top, top, top middle. Um, is a cleric dabbler, which if the mayfly are hatching and you're nymphing and the fish are up eating dries off the top, sometimes I'll fish a cleric dabbler on the top dropper and then my nymphs underneath and that cleric dabbler will just stay high in the film and the fish will pick it off because it's like an emerging mayfly. And then you'll see bottom left, I've got a blob, uh, sorry, a booby. Boobies are very good because what they'll do is they'll keep your flies, they float. So if you have a booby on the point or the top, they're gonna keep your other flies higher in the water column. So another way, if you wanted to fish a washing line, that's what you would do is, that's what you'd probably use, a booby. And then I talked about the blob earlier. Um, our fish just love uh, trout. I said last week, a lot of our Australian trout are not wild, they're stocked. And stocked fish take a liking to color, like we talked about, uh, corals, pinks, oranges, yellows, whites. Um, a blob is, is very much the same, but you can use it when nymphing and the same thing. Fish love eating blobs, um, particularly as you're coming into winter. If you have a calm day, they're particularly good. So um, they also serve that purpose of giving yourself some bulk. So they kind of help you stay tight to your flies because when you try and pull that through the water, you imagine that's on the point fly, so the end, and then you have a fly here, and then you have your fly line up there. If you had a lot of slack in your line here, all you need to do is pull tight. And because this is so bulky, it kind of tightens everything for you. So they're a really good tool to stay connected to your flies with. And then you'll see bottom right there, there's just some traditional wets um, in the bottom rows there. And you can use those on your top dropper. Um, again, just incorporating something different. If the fish are rising and you want to draw something across the surface whilst you're nymphing, you can easily put a little bibio on there, um, a Zulu, mallard and claret something like that and we made it <laughs> so thanks thank you very much for having me guys again 61 is a massive turnout which is super cool um 
some uh, you'll probably already know a lot of um, the flies I've talked about um, or videos are on my YouTube channel. You can see some fly tying there and check out my website, tomjarmanfishing.com or driftwater.com if you're interested in clinics or getting guided. And I'll have some water and let's take some questions. I think I'll let Andrew maybe uh, host the questions. Um, yeah, look, I've got one question that was probably caught up amongst all the auctioneering stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah. And the question was, um, are barbless hooks <laughs> your preference? Yeah. Um, that is, uh, that's a whole talk in itself, barbless hooks versus um, barbed hooks. And I'll take a moment to talk about it because I had this discussion with a friend the other day trying to explain it to them. A lot of people think that a barbed hook holds better. They go, oh, I lose way more fish with a barbed hook. Um, and the fish don't come off. Like they don't, when I fish a barbless hook, the fly goes in and then the fish manage to do a cartwheel or something under the water and then the fly does a magical twist and comes off. Typically what happens when we lose a fish, when we're fighting a fish and then the fish comes off and we go, oh, what's happened is not the hook has worked its way out in reverse, but it's pretty much pulled into, I'll grab a snap lock bag as the example. It's hooked into a bit of skin and then pretty much that happens. Like, so we've hooked the fish, we're fighting and fighting them. And then as we put more and more pressure on, pop, the hook pulls out and it tears a little bit of like the skin away or a little bit of the flesh. Um, what barbless hooks do, barbless hooks obviously don't have a barb, so they can go in more easily. So what happens is with a barbless hook, you hook more fish with like, you'll hook more fish with very little flesh, if that makes sense. So you'll hook fish sometimes with the tiniest slither of skin and it'll stay on, stay on. And sometimes you'll find a lot of people lose fish right when the fish is at the net because they set the net, set the net, and then pop, it comes off. The reason it does that is because the amount of pressure has been building and building and building. And just when it gets to the net, you put a little bit too much pressure on it and the hook does exactly that. It's hooked the flesh and it just goes and pulls straight out like that. Now, people go, um, oh, but when I fish a barbless hook, a barbed hook, that doesn't happen. The hooks stay in and I land a lot more fish. And I'll agree, yes, the number of fish you hook with a barbed hook, uh, you'll probably, they'll stay on because to hook a fish on a barbed hook, um, you have to get a really good chunk of the fish because the fly has to actually, the hook has to go in and the flesh has to go over the top of that barb and onto the other side. So you're not going to be able to hook all those fish that just catch a little slither of the corner of the mouth or the tongue or the skin. That's not, you're actually going to get the feeling with a barbed hook. Um, you'll get a lot of whack, oh, and he's off. And you go, bugger, I missed him. And the reality is it's probably because the fly just couldn't get a piece of him because the hook and had to go over the barb and it was just too much. Whereas if you had a barbless hook, that would actually cut in, like it would just take that little pinch of skin and you'll be amazed at how you can land those fish. But sometimes you lose them, but you're going to hook more fish using a barbless hook is essentially the, the factor. Because they're finer, they go in better. Um, you need less force, to, you need to exert less force to actually get that hook to penetrate and stay in. Um, you'll find they're far, far better. I've probably, so I've rambled, I've tried to spit that out really quickly, so it may not be clear. I'm happy to answer questions on that. But if you sit back, I encourage you to sit back and think about it. I'm not encouraging you to go, I do it with calluses on my hands. I often hook, put the hook in and then pull it and pull it out and see how easily a hook tears through skin. But when we lose a fish, there's a reason why we call, like we talk about pulling a hook. Like pulling a hook is literally pulling a hook and it comes out. It's not going in and then it works its way out backwards because that just doesn't happen. So yeah, I encourage you to have a think about that um, because yeah, I find the more you think about it, I think the more you'll go, hang on a second. Yeah, that's probably what's going on. And I'm not saying that's the answer, but that's my opinion. But um, <laughs> Barney, <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, that's, that's my opinion of what happens. And you know, I have it with barbers hooks where people go, um, a lot of clients will say, wow, I didn't lose a fish all day and they were barbless hooks. And um, you go, yeah, look, the fish ate the fly really well. So every fish you hooked, you got a, a big piece of him. He ate it really confidently. But those days when the fish are just going, they're really touchy and they're not, not eating that well. 
a barbless hook will still hook some of them, but you're likely to lose some because you're only going to hook them through a little bit of skin. And you hear me talking about on the river fishing stuff, fishing um, light flies, or even on the lake, if you watch me on a lake in some of those videos um, on YouTube, you'll see how gently I play fish. I'm very, very slow to land my fish. And the reason for that is I think a lot of the time you only hook a very small amount of skin about of the fish's mouth. And if you people go, oh, I just skull drag them in. And you can skull drag them in if you've hooked them really well and you've got a big piece of cartilage. But if you've only hooked a tiny little bit of their tongue, a little skin on their tongue, you can't skull drag them in because it'll fall off. And then when they fall off, people go, bloody barbless hooks. They don't go, damn, I put too much pressure on that fish. So, um, yeah, sorry. that's a, <laughs> I'm very passionate about that topic. <laughs> Good one. Good one. Um, I've got a couple of questions from Paul, um, which you may have seen. One regarding the materials to get that buggy look. Um, yeah. And the other question coming from it also is regarding fly size or, or hook size. And how do you decide? Do you start big and go small or small and go big? Um, I'll answer the hook size question first on that one. Cool. Um, I mean, you'll find you'll get a lot of confidence with flies. And what you'll end up doing is what I actually do with a lot of my nymph boxes. You go, I, that fly pattern, I only really like fishing that fly pattern on a size 14. And I like, um, like I don't fish. I have a lot of traditionally tied nymphs on a 16, um, but I don't own a single cruncher on a 16 because I like that in a bigger fly size. So you'll find that'll naturally evolve. But if you're turning up to a lake and you're going, do I fish big? Do I fish small? I would say it's all to do with the conditions. If it's really bright and it's calm, I would go small. That's very simple. If it's more overcast and there's a little bit of wind, I'd be inclined to go slightly larger. Um, I would, yeah, that's, that's really the best thing you can do. But you'll find that like um, all my flies uh, for my nymphs are typically between a 12 and a 16. And as we all know, one brand of hooks size 16 is another brand's 14 and one brand's 12 is another brand's 14. So they're all about, you know, they're not, there's not that much difference in them, to be honest. Um, like I'll find all my, a lot of my doorbacks, just looking at them now, are tied on size 12s because they're a long slender fly. So I think that'll kind of start to happen. Um, yeah, for your flies, but conditions are always a good one. The same with streamers. If it's overcast, feel free to fish more, Flash, fish bigger, fish more aggressive. If it's really calm, the fish are touchy. Yeah. And you'll find if the, you're fishing, you go out and you're nymphing and you're fishing 12s and you're getting a lot of like tentative takes that aren't sticking, as soon as that happens, you downsize. So, yeah. Good one. Uh, what about the materials you're using for your natural buggy look? Um, materials? I don't think... Um, yeah. I mean, seals for traditionally tied nymphs, I typically use hairs here in seals for dyed so um could be a blend of uh like dyed black a lot of my flies have a blend of seals fur and hairs ear in them because then we all know seals fur is really annoying to dub um to dub onto a, a like a bit of thread so typically a lot of my seals fur for nymphs i blend it with another material to make it easier to dub but you still get that buggy look um cool. does that answer that one well enough i think it pretty much if you're going, yeah, that if, you're going for buggy, if you're going for buggy looking flies don't tie with a pheasant tail or a slick material like that. Tie for a um, tie for uh, tie with seals for tie with a hair's ear. And you can always get um, take your hat off and pull the velcro off the back and really scruff it up, and that'll help as well. All right, we had a question from Marshall um, just regarding snails being a big food item in uh, Wendaree. So how do you tackle those snail feeders? I make them eat something else. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's interesting. Um, I say that jokingly, but a classic example is if you go to, um, and I'm going to dodge the question here slightly, but if you go to a Tasmanian lake, like Little Pine in like, I don't know, the middle of, if you go to Little Pine in October, um, hopefully we're probably all familiar with that as a fishery um, or no, have heard of it. And you go there and you might, and I don't kill many fish, but if you go there in October and you hit a fish on the head and you cut him open and gut him, you'll, I'll put a hundred dollars on every single time that he'll be full of green scud because that's just what they eat there. 
and yet I have caught him on a Shrek or I've caught him on a humongous or I've caught him on something else. So it's more about, for me, like if I, I like to associate um, food items with um, colour. So if the fish eat a lot of stick caddis in a lake, I don't, and it's overcast and it's windy and it's rough, <laughs> I don't really fish. I typically don't think I'll fish a stick caddis. I think I'll fish something brown and bigger because there's that association. So I don't actually, I'm not a very imitative fisherman, um, probably pretty bad in that way. And I, I probably should pay more attention to it sometimes. But I think for the most part, like you just can't, like it's very hard to imitate. You can't really imitate a, a snail or something like that. But if one of those fish is cruising and you present an unweighted nymph to him and he eats it, um, he, you present an unweighted nymph to him, he's gonna eat it. Like we've all caught fish and you open them up and there's something in there that is absolutely nothing like what you've caught him on. So yeah, they're very opportunistic. Um, but if they're down, that down eating snails, you're not really going to catch them as well. Um, yeah, like you want, you, you want to be looking for the fish that are up. It's all about, there are all, there's, um, Martin Droz has a very good saying. He was the world champion from the Czech Republic. He says, you want to catch the aggressive fish. And there, is, there might be 10,000 fish in a lake and there may only be, a hundred fish that are active looking for, I don't know, that are up swimming around looking for, to eat flies that we'd present to them. So why are we bothering to fish for the 9,900 that are on the bottom, not wanting to feed? We should fish at the hundred that are up looking to feed because the odds are probably better. Yeah, good call. Um, question from uh, Chris Mastwick. Um, can you talk about presenting to a rise when land-based lake fishing? Yeah, um, very. It's pretty much the exact same as um, in um, presenting to. Well, presenting to a rise. If it, the fish has risen and you can catch him on a dry, I would, I would fish a dry to him because you've got a lot more. If a fish eats your dry, and um, I find I have a better hookup percentage, I'll land more of them if I hook them on a dry than on a nymph. So if I could catch him on a dry, I'd present to him with a dry. Um, if we're talking in the nymphing scheme like we are today. Uh, it's the same as on a boat. As soon as the flies hit the water, long draw, because you want to be tight to your flies. Um, but I think the key with presenting to rising fish with nymphs is don't let your flies sink because you don't want your flies to fall beneath them. A trout that's high in the water has a very small cone of vision above him. And often when they're rising, they're sitting so high in the water. And if you cast out there, a lot of the time the fish might be cruising, cruising. And we all talk about like, there's the expression of setting the trap for the fish where you, he's over there swimming across this way and you might cast out your team of nymphs here and be sitting there waiting for him to come and he's coming and your flies have sunk to the bottom and he's swung over the top and never seen them it's very rare for a fish to swim down to eat a fly but they almost always move up to eat a fly or eat a nymph or something so um yeah i'd say no slack but the easiest way to catch a, a fish that's rising is to excite him and try and get him to move to the fly so cast the front and long draw and typically that does it yeah Cool. Um, I think we've got one from Barney regarding the uh, hook gape. Does it have any effect on the uh, on the um, uh, have any effect on the, at all? Barney, do you want to elaborate on that? Are you there, Barney? I I'll unmute myself. Uh, um, I'm back. My question is: I've been increasingly finding myself looking to find larger gape hooks, uh, thinking that it may give me a better hookup rate. You've got more hook hanging down off whatever you're tying it onto. Yep. Um, especially streamer style hooks that have got a lot of stuff hanging out the back, but I'm also now looking at um, larger gape hooks on uh, stuff that's a fair bit smaller. Any comments on that, mate? Yeah. Um... I don't think you need to be afraid at all of um, large gape hooks. Um, the, there's, I don't think, I think I said this last week, if the fish are like, uh, like the fish clearly don't care about our hook that much because otherwise we would never catch a fish. So I don't think that's a consideration. One thing, larger gape hooks are gonna be heavier because to have a larger gape, they need more strength to not be able to open. So you're gonna be, if you're fishing heavy gauge hooks, that means you're going to need a little bit more force to drive the fly in. So if you're fishing a touchy fish, it's not always the best because the, the thicker the gauge of the hook, the more force you need to put to drive the fly in. 
So if you get really plucky fish, um, I would like a finer hook to actually penetrate. So yeah. that's one consideration there with the gape. I don't think it affects the fish eating the fly at all. One thing that, and I don't, this is opening a really big can of worms. Um, <laughs> but thank you. When, we need to remember that when a fish eats a fly, when a fish eats a fly this big, he's not opening his mouth like, ah, to eat it. It's like if we eat, if I was eating a hamburger, I'm going to open my mouth to try and consume the hamburger. But if I was eating a Kit Kat or a, a lolly, I'm not going to open my mouth ridiculously to put a lolly and I'm just going to put it in my mouth. So I don't think the fish always open their, flop, their mouth extremely like wide to eat a, um, like they're not gonna open their fly mass, like their mouth massively to eat a really small food item. So I would just be careful at times if the fish are, if you're fishing a particularly small fly with a wide gate hook, like, yeah, I, I, don't, I just don't know is the short answer. Okay. Um, but I would say that it's unnecessary to go overboard on that topic. Um, but I think sometimes I certainly find a lot more success with like smaller gape hooks. I think if I'm fishing small flies, I don't mind it because you're only getting, if you're fishing a small fly, you're typically fishing some finer tippet, which means you can put less pressure on, you have to put less pressure on the fish. Yeah. Um, and because it's a small hook, it's getting a smaller piece of the fish. Uh, so yeah, you can't put as much pressure on it. So it doesn't really matter anyway. Is that kind of, it's a weird full circle. It all kind of comes around and you kind of go, well, if I'm fishing a small fly and a really, you know, a big thing, like, am I going to be putting, like, if you're fishing a really small fly with a wide gate hook, you're not going to be fishing, you're fishing a small fly because the fish is touchy and you need to fish small. So naturally you're going to be fishing smaller tippet because you can't fish like 10 pound to it or something really big. So it kind of all sorts itself out, I think. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Right. Right, so that was, that was a bad answer. <laughs> that was not too bad. Um, we got one question from Galaxy Tab A, um, which might be a bot. Uh, do you ever <laughs> fish a San Juan worm and under which conditions? Um, I, the, the San, I fish worms uh, on, on lakes, I'm assuming. Um, I'd assume so. Yeah, I fish worms heaps in rivers. Um, no, I don't fish a San Juan in the lake. Um, Fish blood worms, if that's what you're talking about. Like, um, I haven't fished a sand one, but fish blood worms, like the Apps blood worm, which is that one there, if you can, you guys can see it. Um, but I don't fish, yeah, Steve, what's a bot? Um, yeah, I don't, no, is the short answer. I don't fish them on the lake. Although stocked fish do eat squirmy worms really well on a lake. So if you're fishing at stocked fish, freshly stocked fish, a sand one worm would work. But I'd be more inclined to go, rather than the San Juan red, I'd be more inclined to go a pink or a chartreuse or an orange. Yeah. Cool. Um, we've got another one from Leslie. Um, does it? Oh, you can read that one. Me? Yeah, if you like. Uh, the, one, the very last one. Sorry. Doesn't it relate to the sort of fly, a streamer, for example, to a nymph? Was that, that must have been in response to one of our other. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there you go. Oh, hang That's on. The rest of it uh, doesn't relate to the sort of fly a stream, for example, to a nymph, the gate hook. Yeah, um, yeah. Like I would typically fish a larger gate hook for a streamer than I would for a, a nymph, for the reasons we were talking about. Like when the fish eat a woolly bugger, they they want a mouthful and they eat it. And I'm fi typically fishing it on heavier tippet anyway. So, like I fish streamers on heavier tippet than I fish nymphs. Yeah. Awesome. Another one from Marshall about uh, glow, bug, go, glow bugs in lakes. Um, I can't really comment because I've never done it. I've never fished a glow bug in a lake. Um, but I know they do in New Zealand. Um, I 100% would think you could fish them absolutely fine. You could fish them under an indicator like plonking it or fishing it under a bun. It would be absolutely fine. I mean, a glow bug, there's, there's not much of a difference between a glow, a glow bug it's and a glow bug. A yeah. little bit. Yeah. I mean, there's not that, yeah, there's not much between a blob and a glow bug, really. And if you look at there are now, there's a material out there, a blob material called ecstasy, which is 
like an egg material for a blob. So it's suddenly almost becoming an egg. So yeah, I think short answer is yeah, that'd work fine. I just happen to use blobs. Cool. Um, I'm not sure if we've got any more questions. Maybe we can go to a couple of uh, verbals if anyone wants to uh, unmute themselves and- Mark Youngman's got one there. Oh, sorry, I missed that one. Hanging techniques for two or three nymphs. Yeah, so the hang uh, is just the same as last week when we talked about streamer fishing. Typically when we're nymphing, we're in more of a straight line. So the hang is the rod tip raised. And again, uh, the hang for those of you that weren't here last week, we've got, if we have the three stages of the cast, we've got the drop when the flies are falling, the retrieve when they're coming back, and then the lift and hang, hang when the flies ascend just before the boat. And then the hang is when as they're ascending, we want to stop them. Because if a fish is following, we want to give them the chance to eat it rather than just going lift and ripping it out and casting again. So um, I typically hang, uh, Mark, I typically only hang my, I only hang one fly. I literally hang to the top fly. So the top fly to the surface, stop, pause, 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 and then recast. Does that answer that, Mark? I'll take that as a yes. Sounds good. Any verbal question? Hang on, let's go to a gallery view. I've got one, Tom. Yes. Okay, on the lake, say like Wendaree, how would you prefer fishing? Would you prefer drifting with the wind or would you just pick out your little spots and weed beds and fish in those? Drifting 100%. I think water coverage, always. Water coverage, um, you're gonna find more aggressive active fish that way. Um, yeah, that's, I, I, that's a simple one for me, but that's what I'm used to. So, I mean, you absolutely could stay in one area and just fish the area and fish the area and maybe you might get one to eat or another fish might cruise in and then eat there. But for me, I would always try and catch the easy fish. And I think if you're drifting, you're constantly covering new water and potentially new fish, which will be easier to catch. Because every consecutive presentation in one area, I think you kind of, we all kind of know every consecutive cast in the same spot. The odds of catching one are going down and down and down. Whereas so often we go to a new spot, we pull up to a new area, fly hits the water and whack, we've got one straight away. So I think they're a lot easier to catch kind of doing that. Cool. Yeah. Uh, good day, Tom Barney here again. Sorry to nag Hello. you. Um, <laughs> any comments on lock style fishing uh, when you've got uh, two, three, four flies five feet apart uh, going downwind with a big loop, chucking them out and then ripping them across the surface and then waiting to see what happens. Uh, what's the, what was the question it kind of about? <laughs> it just lock style fishing, Tom, in having flies that are a long way apart. Yeah. Uh, and you can't do it in Victoria, but you can do it in Tasmania. Mm. Um, I think lock style is good. It's very good. Um, lo the term lock styling is very much like we've talked about. Uh, we talked last week about streamer fishing and wet fly fishing. We've talked about nymphing this week. I reckon lock styling is 100% its own completely different category and technique. And it's very good. We talked about it very briefly last week when we talked about fishing traditional wets like uh, Bumbles and Kate McLarens and like fishing all those dabblers, fishing those style of flies, they're all traditional lock style flies. Uh, the one thing about like, um, how do I <clears throat> articulate this? The fish have to be, for lock, to lock style, the fish have to be up, yep. um, mm -hmm. but also the fish have to want to chase. Um, so certain lakes, it works like, it works so well in the UK and Ireland, Northern Ireland, because they have so many fish and the number of fish outweighs the amount of food typically. So you can cover like lock styling is so good. This, uh, Maria, this answers your question. Lock styling is so good because it's all about water coverage. Because mm -hmm. when you can catch them lock styling in Tasmania on, on Bronte or um, on Bronte or Penstock, you can typically catch them, on, you can catch them on dries as well. But by lock styling, you're covering more water. You're like combing the water. So you're covering more fish and you're probably catching more of those aggressive fish, which is why it's so good in the UK. And that's why I said last week about how certain lakes in Tasmania lock style better than others. And typically it's the lakes which have less food in them. 
um, the fish seem to want to chase more there. So okay. yeah. um, it's a whole topic into itself, but you could kind of like with the, literally with the setup we talked about here with nymphing and floating lock styling, typically uses a floating line or a slow intermediate or a fast intermediate, um, tapered leader, like what we used here today, like we talked about just today, you could do, you could absolutely do that um, with, um, yeah, just swapping in more, you know, traditional flies like these ones kind of down through here, fishing Zulus, Bumbles, Dabblers, uh, Kate McLaren. Um, yeah, so Palmer style flies. So you could do that. And effectively all it is, is um, uh, all, all lock styling is, is, cast like no drop as soon as the flies hit the water strip 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 like we talked about with the long draws you want to get the flies hitting the water and moving straight away and then you just transition from your draws into instead of a hang or a lift a dibble so you use the wind to sweep the flies across the surface but okay thanks mate that's uh, that's good all right um oh, any question there? <laughs> tom um yeah. when you get uh Glassy conditions, say for example, on Windery and the fish get a bit touchy, do you ever consider going down lighter gear to um, say five weights or even four weights? Um, no, I go, no, but I go find a tippet. Like I fished, uh, that comp I fished five pound tippet, um, like 0.15 or something like that. The Windery comp I won there on Nymphs. Purely, I don't think you need to go to a, five weight or a four weight or something because you're still hooking the fish with unless you're dry fly fishing you're still hooking the fish with the rod pointed at them and if you know your gear you can fight them well enough on uh, a six weight or a seven weight and you can just use a softer a softer six weight I think would do the job for it like my seven weights particularly soft like it's got a it's got a really stiff three quarters of the rod and then the tip is really soft um, so yeah, I think, yeah, you're 100% right going finer, but you're still hooking the, the hook set is always the riskiest part of a, when you're fishing fine tippet, that you're surviving the hook set and the initial impact is always the hardest point. That's where you typically break them off, not mid fight. So yeah, I, I kind of just roll with it with a six, seven weight and just do the best I can. Yeah. And it was the same, actually, Ross, it was the same in Italy at the Worlds when we talked about do you use um, a four weight on the lake over there fishing for all the small browns in the lake there and all the other countries like uh, Wojta Unger from the Czech, I spoke to him about it because a lot of, like I had a few fish fall off halfway back or I had two fall off and I, where the hooks just pulled on them and he was like, nah, because you need the strength and that was a lake a bank session and he was like, nah, well, you need the the weight of the rod to cast long. You want a seven weight or an eight weight to launch it. And it would probably be the same in those conditions on like when the say it was really tough and you were nymphing and it was a glass out and you had a four weight and then you had one miracle fish started rising like, you know, 60 feet down from you. It would be so much easier to just pick up, cover him and catch him on a six weight than on a four weight just the delivery and the speed of your fly. So he, what he said to me was that outweighs fishing the lighter option. Yeah. Any other, anything else? I think we're, good. I think we're winding up. Um, last and final call. 